Hello everyone, and welcome to a new video of the Attack Reviews. Today we'll be looking at something really special. It's a Dell Vostro 3681. It comes with the 11th generation Intel CPU along with the B560 motherboard. The computer itself looks pretty much like the last generation Vostro. Please note that this computer is not released yet, so what we're looking at today is engineering sample. Final design may change on the motherboard. Okay, now let's dive into it. That's a classic Dell engineering sample. It's got the uh, blue motherboard instead of grain on the production unit. Um, it's got a what looks like a very basic heatsink, and it's got two PCIe slots. However, the engineering sample board is missing the PCIe 4.0 x8 slot. Um, however, after checking the BIOS and checking with my source where I get it from, the production unit will most likely have the socket soldered. Okay, so let's turn it around and take off the side panel. So here we can see two RAM slots, two uh, SATA ports, and one M.2 slot. However, the M.2 slot is only M.2 2240, which means you wouldn't be able to fit a regular SSD in it. The RAM slots are placed very close to each other. All the memories I have that has heatsink on them wouldn't fit in both slots. So during this test, I have to use the only memory I have that does not come with heatsink. That's the DDR4 16 gigs 2666 megahertz memories. Okay, so here, let's take a better look at the motherboard. And also what's interesting is, um, it's only got a four pin CPU connector. And what looks like another eight pin connector to the motherboard. So yes, this motherboard is using a new Intel 12 volt standard. So uh, 12 volt will be the only voltage that's being fed into the motherboard. So um, here's a look at the power supply. It's a 200 watt 12 volt only power supply. It comes with the 11th generation 11700 CPU. But what we have here is a ES1 engineering sample. Um, guess which one is the new CPU? They kind of look similar. The 11th generation has a longer IHS. It's more of a rectangular shape rather than square. And on the back, you can see the capacitor is totally different. Okay, enough about the hardware side. Now uh, let's dig into it. And let's start from installing the driver software. So firstly, I tried to install the driver software from Intel website. However, I found out that the newest download from Intel website would not support what we have here. Luckily, I was also able to get a set of driver software for this particular machine. So um, let's install the graphics driver first. And now with the graphics driver installed, we can see that the computer already recognized the new video card. We fired up GPU-Z, however, um, it is not recognizing our integrated GPU at all. Let's take a look at the information here. So uh, it has eight cores and 16 threads, which is the same as a uh, 10700. It also has a 65 watt TDP, which is also the same as the 10700 non-K version. Um, what's different is it adds up the uh, support for AVX512 instructions. And according to my experience, AVX512 will consume unbelievable amount of power and output insane amount of heat. And I guess that's why Intel decides to step down on the core count for this generation. Um, the most obvious change other than AVX512 is the cache algorithm. The 11700 we have here has 12 weights of 48 kilobytes of L1 data cache compared to uh, 8 weights of 32 kilobytes on the 10700. It also has 512 kilobytes, 8-way L2 cache compares to 4-way 246 kilobytes on the uh, 10700. But the L3 cache remains the same. Now let's start with the CPU-Z benchmark. But keep in mind, this is an ES1 processor and it only has 1.8 gigahertz default clock. Although it should be running at the turbo speed anyways, but this has 65 watt TDP. And since this being the Dell machine, they would strictly follow that 65 watt TDP limit, which is nothing for a core CPU like this. So um, that would also have some influence on the score. However, um, here we have 511 points for a single core, 
and about 5100 for a multi-core. This is pretty disappointing, but considering its low base clock and TDP limit, as well as the uh, Dell B560 motherboard, it's still understandable. Next, let's open up iDAC64 to find out more information about our system. iDAC64 actually recognized that we're using a Tiger Point H chipset and it's asking us if we want to upload information about it. Um, in this case, I would rather not. So um, here we are. It says octa-core 3800 megahertz turbo. For some reason, um, IDA64 is recognizing the GPU as three separate Gen 12 mobile GPUs. And here we can see that um, the T-junction is 100 degrees, which means it will start thermal throttling once it reaches 100 degrees. The TDP is, of course, 65 watts, and the TDC is 285 amps. For the PL1, it's 65 watts for 8 seconds by default, and the PL2 is 224 watts, but it's only 2.44 milliseconds, which is nothing. Uh, for the total behavior, the max turbo on a single core is 4400 megahertz and the old core is 3800 megahertz which is considerably lower than any retail 8 core chip Intel has right now but that's because it's an engineer sample I already got an 11900K arriving and we're doing a lot of tests and benchmarks on it we will upload the video next week so uh, please stay tuned uh, for the instruction set, we can see that it adds support for AVX512. So when I'm checking on the motherboard, it says ECC supported but disabled. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a mistake by IDA64 or what I have on hand is actually a Xeon variant of the 11th generation CPUs. It will be interesting if Intel adds unofficial ECC support to the 11th generation processors, just like what AMD is doing on the Ryzen processors. And as for the uh, south bridge, we can see that it recognized that we're using the Intel Tiger Point B560. However, um, that's pretty much the only information it has. And the chips that we have here is revision 00. For the PCIe controller, we're using a PCIe 4.0 Samsung 981 SSD. However, it's saying that it's running at PCIe 2.0 by 4 mode. We'll have to confirm that later. Next, let's do some Prime 95 pressure test. So we're gonna do small FFTs and let's check out the power consumption and the temperature. So we're doing 16 threads here and the power values are strictly limited at 65 watts, as you can see in IDA64. The temperatures are pretty low, but considering the low TDP, it does make sense. And if we look at the turbo frequency here, it's pretty bad. We're running around 2100 to 2200 megahertz because of the power limit. And that kind of explains why our score is so low in the previous tests. Next, let's fire up Crystal Disk Info to confirm if our SSD is running at PCIe 4.0 mode. However, it seems that our SSD is actually running at PCIe 3.0 by 4. Okay, that is definitely PCIe 3.0. So for some reason, this Dell motherboard does not support PCIe 4.0. It is still utilizing PCIe 3.0 for the M.2 slot. However, um, the score is still pretty good. Next comes the Cinebench test. We're running both single and multi-core test. And the result is pretty disappointing. So um, it is way slower than i7-10700 in both single and multi-core testings. That could be the TDP limit, because I noticed that for the 11th generation, each core is consuming more power at the same frequency. But again, it's an engineering sample chip, so that could be the problem. Things aren't any better in R20 as well. So um, if we take a look at the score, it is about 10% slower than i7-10700. Next, let's try some Geekbench 5 CPU benchmark. Um, I'm leaving IDA64 and CPU-Z on so you can see the temperature and the frequency. So our processor is boosting at its max boost for all cores and the power consumption is actually pretty low. And the temperature actually remains in the low 60s 
which is pretty surprising to me considering how slim that heat sink is. What I also notice here is that the voltage is really high for the frequency. Next, let's see how the new graphics performs. So here we're going to run the OpenCL test first in uh, Cinebench R15. So here's the result. Um, it is so close to the last generation iGPU that it's almost within a margin of error. This is not exactly what I expected. Next, let's run some Geekbench 5 OpenCL to see uh, how the new iGPU performs in compute tests. Um, here are the results. Actually, to my surprise, unlike Cinebench R15, it is actually getting a great improvement in the compute test. We're looking at about 15% increasement over the past generation for both Vulkan and OpenCL test. Next, let's run some 3D marks. Since this is iGPU, so we'll be running Night Raid instead of uh, Time Spy. So here we go. Actually, it's not looking bad. It's averaging about 35 to 40 FPS, which is higher than my expectation. As for the score, you'll be really surprised. It's getting 2,000 points, which is 30% faster than i7-10700. And it's actually running at a lower frequency, 1100 MHz compares to uh, 1200 MHz on the 10700. Good job, Intel. And also if we check the details, that 3D Mark is not reading our GPU frequency correctly. Uh, it remains zero throughout the testings. And we do have some spikes for the CPUs, but the temperature is, however, pretty consistent, as well as the uh, power consumption. So um, since TDP is becoming so much of a problem, let's fire up the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility and see if we can actually change that. So um, here we are, and it's displaying some basic informations, just like what we have seen in the IDA64. Um, since this is a lock chip, so it wouldn't let us do anything to the multiplier. However, we can actually adjust the Turbo Boot Power Max, which is the TDP, and a Turbo Boot Short Power Max, which is PL2. So here I'm gonna set it to 125 watts, just like the K chips for the 10th generation. And we're gonna change the uh, Turbo Boost power time duration to 128 seconds, which is the maximum allowed by the software. So now let's go back to do more testings and see if that's gonna make a difference. So uh, let's redo the CPUC benchmarks. The strange thing here, however, is that we're actually achieving lower single core score. However, the multi-core score remains about the same. So let's see if things are different in Cinebench R15. So here we actually got 1690 points. That's 190 points over the previous result, which is about 15%. Not to be honest, it's a gap from i5 to i7. So that's like a free upgrade just by removing the PL1 power limit. We're seeing similar results in Cinebench R20. Um, we're getting 600 points more, which is close to 20% increase in performance. So you can also do this to a non-K CPU. That will squeeze 15 to 20% of performance out of your CPU, giving you adequate cooling. So let's run Prime 95 again and see how the CPU performs with 125 watt of TDP. Um, so here we go. As you can see, the power consumption is insane. It's at 165 watts, and we're staying around 3500, 3400 megahertz, and the temperature rockets. The CPU package is around 100 degrees, and yes, it is thermal throttling. And I can see why Dow is putting a 65 watt limit on this system, because the cooling solution just cannot handle anything beyond that. However, the actual just knocked on my door when I was filming this, and this is what I got. Yes, you're right, it's the Z590 ASUS ROG board. And with the board, I got a driver disk, which will give me the newer driver for the chipset and the graphics. So here we are. So let's install the new graphics driver and see if that's going to give us any improvement in performance. So just a quick preview. 
we'll be doing a comparison video of Z590 with the Z490. And we'll be also adding a RTX 3080 to the test to see if PCIe 4.0 actually has any benefit on the card. And we'll be testing four of the Samsung 9A1 in RAID 0 mode on the new Z590 motherboard to see what kind of benefit could PCIe 4.0 bring to the Intel platform. So please subscribe if you don't want to miss that. So here we're running 3 d Mark again with our new graphics driver as well as the 125 watts TDP limit. We're achieving about 500 points increase, which is about 10%. This will conclude our review for today. I know there's a lot more to be tested for the 11th generation CPUs, but obviously the Dell computer is not the best test platform. Being a virtual line of PC, it is designed more for business rather than gaming. And with the slim heatsink, only four phases of CPU power delivery and overly close memory slots, there are very little things to play with. Not to say it's 200 watt power supply and a missing PCIe slot. But luckily, the ASUS ROG Maximus 13 Hero Z590 motherboard has just arrived and the 11900K is on the way. So in the next video, I will be comparing the Maximus 13 Hero with the Maximus 12 Hero and tell you why you should or shouldn't buy a Z590 motherboard. And spoiler alert, I am getting much better scores with the same CPU on the Z590 board compared to what I'm getting on this Dell system. Okay, that's it for today's video. If you liked the video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching.